Visitors driving along a road like this don't often notice the changes going on around them. But people who work on roads do. In fact, they're usually the first ones to spot changes. And all across the country, road maintenance crews are noticing a growing problem, a foreign invasion. This is one of the invaders. It's called St. John's wart. And like hundreds of other plant species that have been brought into the U.S. from other parts of the world, it's now spreading out of control. You're probably familiar with some of the invasive plant species in your own region. You've seen firsthand how rapidly they spread and take over entire areas. You may have already found them encroaching on your favorite fishing or hunting spot, in your neighborhood, or on your own property. These invaders aren't just a nuisance, they're a serious threat. Economists estimate that noxious weeds already cost this country $20 billion a year, mostly in lost agricultural income, as they overrun farms, ranches, and grazing lands, infest water supplies, and sicken animals. Government agencies spend hundreds of millions of tax dollars each year battling invasive species on public lands, along highways, and in environmentally sensitive areas. Businesses and private landowners are fighting similar battles in communities across the country. Plus, invasive species are wreaking havoc on the environment, driving native plants and animals out of their natural ranges and threatening the survival of dozens of endangered species. And the problem is worsening. In the western United States alone, 17 million acres, an area three times the size of Massachusetts, is infested with noxious weeds. And every day, another 4,600 acres are lost. What does this have to do with road maintenance? How does it involve you? You might be surprised. few invasive species for a couple decades now. We have a significant infestation of scotch broom and I have noticed the increase in them, especially the last six years. We moved to Idaho about six years ago and as we drive along and look at the hillsides you'd see greenery and you think boy that looks pretty good. So you get up close and look and it was rush skeleton weed, which is a pretty severe noxious weed. The first time I noticed an invasive species in our area would have been in the early 80s. However, at that time I'm sure I was not aware that it was an invasive species. Probably six or eight years ago, we uh, started noticing star thistle, particularly in a fire area. I first started noticing invasive species approximately 13 years ago. We found this large field of knapweed here. Purple loose strife and some of the other species started showing up uh, years ago, rush skeleton weed, population of 40 acres that could have been treated then, now it covers more than 3 million acres in Idaho. You probably remember the first time you noticed a new weed along the road. Since then, you might have seen that weed spread to new areas and other noxious plants appear. So you know what we're talking about here. What you may not know is that roads are the main arteries that carry these invaders from one place to another. The roadways are a biggest problem for us where invasive species are and when they grade the road then they catch it on the blade and it spreads it down the road then recreationists come along and they pick up the seeds from the plants that were graded onto the road and spread them to campgrounds. An off-road vehicle plunges through a stand of invasive species, picks up seeds, and carries them to the next off-road spot, or back home. And suddenly, that invasive species has a new foothold miles away. A grader doing ditch work, or a backhoe cleaning out a culvert, picks up root fragments and carries them to the next job site. Or weeds infest a gravel pit, and 25 loads are carried off and laid down before anyone realizes there's a problem. This video can help you and your crew avoid spreading these dangerous travelers and contribute to your region's efforts to control them. The first step is to learn to identify the invasive species in your area. 
Several states have published guides to local invasive species, and some agencies include species identification in their crew training programs. A real handy item put out by U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highways Administration, that you can keep right in the glove compartment of your maintenance vehicle is a guide on common roadside invasive plants. It's a nice trifold. It's color-coded by the different plants. It looks at flowers. It also covers a lot of the roadside invasive grasses. Information is also available online at a number of government and non-government websites. But the best sources of information are your local weed control specialists. In fact, they're your most valuable partners for learning how to tell one weed from another and how these plants thrive, compete, reproduce, and can be controlled. Well, I think uh, education is very important uh, as a tool for fighting noxious weeds and also introducing the employee to the local weed specialist and encouraging the employee to contact this person to seek assistance if they find noxious weeds. Once you can identify the invasive species in your area and in neighboring areas, you can keep an eye out for them, especially on the job. Many agencies map infestations of invasive species. Mapping helps scientists and land managers identify problem areas and patterns of spread and decide where to focus containment and control efforts. By reporting any infestations you see, you're contributing to this effort. And if you spot a new patch of growth early enough and report it right away to your supervisor or weed control specialist, chances are it can be eradicated before it gains a foothold. And that's important. Because, as anyone who deals with these invaders will tell you, once they get established in an area, it can be close to impossible to eradicate them. If you see something new starting, you know, jump on it quickly and, and, and get it eradicated. I mean, when, when you have just small infestations, you can use a, you know, you can kind of have the philosophy, we can eradicate it, we can keep it out of the area. Uh, once it gets established over large areas and large numbers, it's very difficult to eradicate. Depending on the type of plant we're talking about, eradication and control might involve chemical treatment, mechanical treatment, or a combination of both. When to use herbicides and which herbicides to use depends on a number of factors. Which chemicals are most effective against the target species? How many applications would be required? How will other species be affected? Are there water or wetlands close by? What would the herbicide treatment cost? There are also federal and state regulations governing the use of herbicides, especially in protected environments and on public lands. If your crew does herbicide applications, you're already aware of the restrictions and precautions involved. If you have questions, your local weed control specialists are there to answer them. Some noxious weeds that are especially resistant to herbicides have to be treated mechanically. The same is true for infestations in areas where herbicides can't be used safely. We have a 40-acre special interest area, has significant infestation of scotch broom. It also has a potential red-legged frog, an endangered species uh, habitat creek running through it, so the use of herbicide is prohibited. So we've found out that if you hand lop scotch broom in the fall when it's drought stressed, we're able to kill those shrubs without doing any ground disturbance. If you yank them out, that of course will kill the shrub, but you also disturb soil and you get a hundred little seedlings coming up. But if you lop it at the right time, you will kill the plant. Roadside species that reproduce through flowers and seeds may be controlled simply by mowing them before they reach the seed stage. Keep in mind, though, that these species often will flower again after mowing, so check with your local weed specialist for advice. It's just as important not to mow once these plants have gone to seed to avoid having the mowers spread the seeds up and down the roadway. In some cases, it may be necessary to bag and burn or otherwise properly dispose of the cuttings when you mow. Cutting and mowing also work for many invasive shrubs and trees 
for infestations that are close enough to the road, a boom-mounted brush mower can be very effective. And because of its reach, it can do the job without disturbing any more ground than necessary. This is important because the spores and seeds of many invasive species germinate best in disturbed soil. So cutting down one invader could inadvertently aid the spread of another. Chainsaws and weed whackers can, of course, be used where heavy machinery can't, and they are often the best available control method. As with mowing, it's important to know whether the cuttings can be left in place or have to be collected and disposed of, in part to control the spread of the plant and in part to avoid creating a fire hazard. It's also important to limit cutting to the invasive species and to avoid as much as possible disturbing the native plants. For some species, the most effective strategy is a combination of chemical and mechanical treatments. Alanthus, for example. Just cutting the stalk actually stimulates the roots to sprout more quickly. The solution? Apply herbicide so the roots can't sprout. Then, after the herbicide has done its work, come back, cut down the dead stalks, and chip them, leaving the mulch in place so that any surviving plant fragments won't be carried away to spread the infestation elsewhere. When I first started, we used to go out and cut, come back and cut, and every year it seemed like it was getting thicker and thicker. So now, over the last few years, now as we cut, we treat the stumps, and we maintain a good mowing cycle and we maintain a herbicide schedule with spraying and it's gotten a lot better and actually it's gotten a lot cheaper for us. It's cheaper to maintain. For species that are susceptible to fire, under the right conditions, controlled burning can be effective. For species that can't tolerate any disturbance of their roots, tilling can work well. And over the past 10 years or so, there has been growing interest in biological controls introducing insects that feed only on particular invasive species without affecting native plants. Some of the biocontrols we're using on spotted knapweed are seed head gallflies and uh, seed head weevils and root borers. Since we've put biocontrols in the knapweed, we've seen the height of the knapweed drop and the plants are becoming not as dense, so it's thinning the plants out pretty good. Even with all these different control options available, there is little hope in the short term of recovering most of the millions of acres that have been overrun. The primary concern now is to stop these invaders from spreading any further. And because roadways are proven routes for spreading the invasion, a lot of the responsibility falls on road maintenance crews. So what do you need to know? And what precautions do you have to take on the job to avoid accidentally spreading invasive species? First, know before starting work what noxious weeds you're going to encounter and where you should deposit contaminated material. When we begin a work project, we uh, talk to the botanist, the forest botanist, and uh, we get the district health resource officers and such out there to help identify suitable locations to dump the material. Take cleaning ditches and culverts, for example. If you know ahead of time that there are patches of invasive species along the work route, you and your local weed control team can decide on a strategy. Depending on the plant, it might be best to mow or treat the patches with herbicide ahead of time. In many cases, it's also a good idea to have the grader or backhoe bypass small infested areas and instead clear those areas by hand. It's more work, but it lessens the chances of spreading contaminated soil. Whether you use hand tools or heavy equipment, the rule is the same. Clean your equipment thoroughly before moving to the next work location, even if it is on the same road. Any material that you know or suspect is contaminated should be stockpiled at a separate site and that site mapped and, if necessary, posted so that the material isn't used on another road project. You have to take similar precautions with materials that you bring to a job site. Know your sources and use only materials that are weed-free. I try to get 
to all of our gravel pits on a yearly basis before they get used and treat them, make sure that there's no weeds or weed seeds there. And it's never going to be 100%. There, there are weed seeds that will settle out on gravel pits and you will be moving some. And that's why it's important that we keep treating roads and making sure that we're not encouraging the spread of noxious weeds along roadsides. But if people are moving gravel, if you let somebody like me know ahead of time, I'll go in there and make sure that we don't move the weeds too. Materials that are certified as weed free are becoming more readily available and are the preferred choice, especially for use in environmentally sensitive areas. If sources of weed free materials are not available in your area, you may need to develop them. In addition, many agencies monitor their own local material supplies and more and more quarry operators and suppliers of straw and other erosion control products are making special efforts to ensure that their materials are uncontaminated. Gravel pits, for example, are increasingly monitored for signs of weeds. And at certain facilities, gravel is thoroughly washed to remove seeds, spores, and plant parts, or sterilized with heat. Manufacturers are also developing products specifically designed to keep roadways and other areas weed-free. Weed-free fiber roll barriers and sediment logs, for example. It's often worth considering these products when planning a job in an area where invasive species are of special concern. And of course, when revegetating an area, always use appropriate species, native species if possible. To reduce the spread of noxious weeds, it's very important to put native forb seed back on those areas that you're doing road maintenance. If you don't put anything back, those plants that can best compete will come into those areas. And what we're finding is the, the plants that compete the best are the noxious weeds. Many agencies have developed seed mixes that are scientifically matched to the local environment and can compete well against noxious weeds. Some have established their own nurseries for cultivating native plants suitable for revegetation or established agreements with local nurseries to supply appropriate plants. We are collecting the seed on the site prior to any construction project, propagating the seed to make sure that we're putting out the right seeds for the right project and reducing the threat of noxious weeds. In addition to proper selection and handling of materials, there are other good work practices that help minimize the spread of invasive species. First, remove only the minimum amount of native vegetation when doing any job leave as many native plants and as much soil as possible in place and undisturbed. For cleaning ditches, consider using a loader and dump truck instead of a grader. If used properly, loaders can leave a lot more vegetation and a lot less bare soil in the ditch than a grader can. And instead of possibly spreading contaminated soil along the roadway, loaders deposit it into dump trucks for proper disposal. Second, control public traffic through or near the job site. Construction and maintenance activities stir up spores and seeds and spread contaminated materials that can easily hitch a ride on passing vehicles. Establishing strict traffic control is a good way to minimize this problem. Third, and perhaps most important, make sure that maintenance vehicles and equipment do not become carriers of dangerous travelers. This holds true not just for government-owned equipment, but all rented and contractor-owned equipment as well. It is now required in every contract that we have uh, for um, construction projects and any, any uh, off-road equipment that they be clean and free of any weed seeds or spores that might spread into a new area. The best insurance is to power wash everything thoroughly, cleaning every surface of visible soil or debris, and inspecting it carefully before moving it to or from the job site. It was requested that we come up with something to address mobile wash applications for small construction projects and small fire situations where you need something that's portable and mobile. This system will wash down all the soil and hopefully all the seeds and so forth that have been deposited on the equipment and then filters them out so they can be disposed of properly. Keep in mind that the Clean Water Act and other regulations require that runoff containing pollutants must be contained and properly disposed of. Check with your local natural resources manager before doing any power washing on site. 
If a portable power washer can't be brought to the site, the next best alternative is to establish a central washing area and strict rules and procedures for washing vehicles and equipment before moving them from one job to another. Containment mats and wash racks can be used to capture any seeds and plant debris and prevent them from contaminating the soil. And of course, debris containing the seeds of invasive plants should be collected for disposal in a landfill and the washing area continually monitored for weeds and treated if necessary. Always assume that the last site that a rented or contractor owned piece of equipment worked on was infested. Insist that the equipment be washed before being brought to your site and then inspect it carefully before allowing it to go to work. Finally, inspect equipment and vehicle storage areas regularly to make sure that they're not harboring weeds that can be carried to work sites. Perform inspections often enough to catch new growth early and eliminate it before it gets established. The precautions needed to stop the advance of invasive species are mostly common sense. Learn to identify the invaders in your area, keep a lookout for them, and report new sightings right away. Know what invasive species are on or near each job site and work with your local weed control team to develop a plan for dealing with them. Keep contaminated materials quarantined and make sure that all materials you bring on site are weed free. And don't let your equipment become part of the problem. Wash and inspect everything thoroughly before going on to the next job. It all comes down to treating each invasive plant species like an infection or disease, and treating its seeds and other parts like disease germs that can spread easily and quickly if we aren't careful. And in fact, these dangerous travelers are an infection in our environment, one that's already damaging agriculture, wildlife, and public and private lands, and costing taxpayers millions of dollars each year. The people that live here, their lifestyle is affected. They're ranchers, and they cannot graze this field anymore because it is totally knapweed. Farmers have a real problem with things like fresh skeleton weed, for instance, when it gets in their wheat fields. Uh, it drastically reduces the ability to grow wheat. In Montana, they've already lost millions of acres of summer and winter range for the deer and the elk. Invasive species will create monocultures where We'll lose a lot of our insects, our rodents, a lot of our animal and plant life, native species. They can make the forests and our rangelands more flammable. They have no natural enemies in this area, and they can just completely take over. They can get into wetland lake areas and choke up the habitat, ruin the habitat for fisheries, as well as duck hunting. Unfortunately, many of these invasives that we're talking about have little economic value. Also, they have very little value to wildlife. And so the entire ecosystem of the forest changes. Recreation will be affected because we won't be able to keep up with the maintenance on hiking trails with uh, yellow star thistle, which you can't walk through in shorts. You can barely walk through in jeans. From a highway standpoint, when you drive down the road, you're not going to be able to see the signs that you used to be able to see. It will definitely be a big change, and it's not going to be a good one. If we don't start controlling invasive species, we're going to start using up more and more of our resources, our budget, toward invasive plant control when we should be putting it on the road surface. Everyone who enjoys the outdoors has a special interest in preserving it. And those of us who work outdoors have a special responsibility to do what we can. And an almost daily opportunity to make a real difference. So spread the word, not the weeds. Anyone working along the highways, should they see something they know or think is an invasive species, they should contact somebody in the highway department, be it the roadside specialist or a weed specialist in their program, whatever they would have, and notify them, even if they're not sure that it is, because it might be. When we first see a few plants showing up, it's very cheap to eradicate those plants. It's very cheap to, to keep species from coming in to do preventive practices. The fight against the invasive species can only be won if everybody does their part. It really is a team effort. I mean, if one crew is maintaining a part of a section of the road and the next guy down the road is not doing anything, it's going to spread. It only takes one individual to track those seeds into a non-invaded area 
for that invasion to begin. And once it's begun, it's going to take additional resources away from the battles on existing species to go after the one that was spread by the one individual who didn't think it was a concern. We're the ones entrusted to manage that corridor, and if we don't do it, nobody will. For more information on controlling invasive species, contact your local weed management specialist.